Jesus Christ has always been a divisive figure. 2,000 years ago, the message about him exploded onto the ancient world as many resonated with his offer of good news of forgiveness and eternal life, and many believed in him. Yet many Christians in the first century were also hated. Roman emperors such as Nero and Domitian hated the Christians because they served an alternative leader. That Christians defied the Roman gods. Indeed, many faithful Romans believe that the reason the crops failed, that there was disease, bad weather, famine and suffering, was because Christians were turning the populace against the Roman gods. And hence, the gods were angry. They believed that Christians were the root cause of the problems of the world. So the Roman leadership arrested and tortured the Christians. Domitian exiled one of these believers, John, to Patmos, to assuage the gods and to seek blessing and prosperity for the people. A law was made, no Christian once brought before the tribunal should be exempted from punishment without renouncing his religion. Yet despite all of this, the Christian message grew. People loved and adored and followed and worshipped Jesus. They found in him love, peace, hope and eternal life. And so if you were a Christian believer living at this time, how would you feel? You had the good news, a sweet message, but this opposition would raise many big questions. How can you trust God when the forces of evil seem triumphant? Is there any good news here? And it's to this context that the book of Revelation is written. And John writes his remarkable book addressing some of these big questions and more. But some of these big questions are becoming very re more relevant in our culture today. Now we don't see Christians being tortured in Australia today, but Christianity no longer holds the public respect or preeminence that it once did. Indeed, there's, a, a fact, a, a rising hostility towards Christians and Christianity in our culture. Now, controversial media commentator Andrew Bolt, now I don't agree with everything Andrew says at all, but he wrote a few years back, he wrote, Christians, prepare for persecution. Open your eyes and choose stronger leaders for the dark days. I am not a Christian. But I am amazed that your bishops and ministers are not warning you of what is already breaking over your heads. He outlined a number of situations where it's no longer acceptable to promote the Christian message or hold Christian values in our world today. And last year we saw Andrew Thorburn lose his job for his face. And recently I saw a woman in the UK arrested for silently praying outside an abortion clinic. Christendom, the idea that Christianity is a Christian country, has ended in Australia. Our culture has moved away from Christianity so that now Christians are more marginalised and facing something approaching a form of persecution. So perhaps the message of Revelation is just as relevant as here today in Melbourne, as modern Melbourne, as it was in the first century. And so now let's have a look at this Revelation chapters 10 and 11 now. And I, I must confess, I'm not sure what you made of it when you just heard it read out just then. It may seem somewhat bewildering and confusing. In fact, I was invited to preach on these chapters at uh, another, ch another church a few years back because the pastor was going away on holidays. Then I read these chapters and I could see why he wanted to go on leave. <laughs> Maybe this is why some skeptics have thought that you know, the book of Revelations are ravings of a maniac or deranged fantasies. But John, the author of Revelation, wrote be understood. He wrote carefully and thoughtfully using apocalyptic language, a sort of symbolic picture code language to encourage Christian believers in their circumstances. And in this middle section of Revelation from chapters 6 to 12, John writes about the history of the world using a series of symbolic codes revolving around the number 7. 7, which means the number of completeness. So John describes the same set of events but from different perspectives, just like an action replay of a sporting event. And so from chapters 5, 1 to 7, 8, 5, John outlines a mighty angel bringing an important scroll with, um, an important scroll with seven seals. 
Seals that only the perfect lamb, Jesus the Messiah, could open. Seals offering one action replay, one description of the judgment of the world. And then in Revelation 8, 2, we're introduced to the next action replay, the next cycle of judgment with seven angels with seven trumpets. And this cycle continues from chapters 8 to 11. And so this section that we're looking at today is part of this cycle of the seven angels and their trumpets. And yet at the start of chapter 10, we see John insert a set of brackets between angels 6 and 7. There's a disruption in the flow, which we've seen in chapters 8 and 9, where each successive angel sounds a trumpet. And then uh, in chapter 10, 1, where John says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. Now this is not the seventh angel blowing the seventh trumpet, but sort of John's brackets here explaining a little bit of an interlude. I think the first six angels and trumpets describe things that are already unfolding and already happening in the world. And now he pauses and he expands on what's happening in the present age before the seventh angel blows his trumpet in 11.15, which heralds the final judgment of the world, which we'll look at next week, which is a reason to come back um, and understand what's happening there. But as we read this section, we read with anticipation of the seventh trumpet being blown. The final judgment hasn't come yet. And so here at the beginning of chapter 10, he introduces a mighty angel who appears with the authority to bring news of judgment. Now angel means messenger or herald. And we learn that this mighty angel is substantially different from the six angels with the six trumpets which have come before. The seven angels with the seven trumpets stood before God, yet John uses Old Testament imagery here and symbols to indicate that this angel has divine attributes. He's coming from heaven. He's robed in a cloud and a rainbow. And in the Old Testament, only God alone comes in the clouds. A rainbow recalls the appearance and likeness of the glory of God in Ezekiel 1.28. And this angel has a face like the sun as God dwells in unapproachable light and pillars of fire recalls God's presence of God, uh, uh, with the Israel in the wilderness. And so John has used several images here, several coded languages here, to indicate that this angel has divine attributes and is immensely powerful. And this angel, a bit like the Colossus of Rhodes, stands with the authority of God over all creation, standing astride both land and sea. And so this angel's message is for all creation. This angel comes with God's direct authority. And he brings some news. And this is represented by the little scroll which lies open in his hand. The scroll appears to be the same scroll which we first saw sealed up with the seven seals in chapter 5. Which described God's master plan of judgment and redemption of the world. But now the scroll lies open. The Lamb has opened the contents of the scroll and so this message is now plain and clear for all to see. And so this divine angel brings the news at the heart of the Christian message. And when he speaks, John tells us that seven thunders also speak. Now thunders here are not the imagined dragons kind of thunders, but these thunders represent judgments. So this angel brings news of more judgment, consistent with the cycles of seven seals, seven angels, seven trumpets. We now anticipate a series of seven thunders. Now this is all pretty intense. There's already a lot of blasting and killing and death and judgment in Revelation. And we hear there is more to come. A mighty divine angel appears with the authority of God to bring this news of judgment. But then we see in verse 4 that what John is about to write, what the seven thunders have to say. But John then hears a second voice. And this voice isn't from the angel, but comes from heaven and says, Seal up the thunders. Don't write it down. This is an intriguing development. John is given a revelation of these seven thunders, these seven judgments. But he's also told not to share them. They're not revealed here. Why is this? Well, we're not really sure. Perhaps we've already heard enough about how those opposed to God will be judged or perhaps it might be that the news that the thunders bring is so awful and terrifying that words can't adequately express it. We're not told why John shouldn't write them down but it does demonstrate that there's more to the invisible plans of God in the future that we know. 
There are things about the future that we are kept from knowing and will never know, which perhaps keeps us humble and reminds us that God alone is in control of the judgment of the world. So then what happens instead? Well, the great angel makes an oath to God, to the one who created the heavens and the earth, and he makes an oath that there will be no more delay. The judgment will happen. The present age will finish, be completed, and be judged. This mighty angel anticipates the seventh angel with the seventh trumpet, who is about to come and sound his trumpet to pronounce final judgment. Remember, this explains the reason for the interlude between the sixth and the seventh angels. The angel is explaining what is happening at present before the final angel comes to herald the final judgment. And what happens before the end? Well, look there in verse 7. The mystery of God will be accomplished. Now, mystery is not mysterious, but a mystery is something that was hidden but is now revealed. Like Ephesians 1, where the mystery of God's will will come together under Christ has been made known. So this is the mystery that will be accomplished at the end. That through Jesus' death and resurrection, all things will truly and really and will fundamentally be under Christ. So John isn't dwelling on judgment here. He's focusing on the fact that at the end, the great plan of God will be accomplished. That there will be, might be an inkling that there is good news for those who believe and preach the gospel of Jesus, even if they're punished or persecuted now. Now this would be reassuring to people who are suffering for the gospel, wouldn't it? That one day your present suffering will end. The seventh angel will sound his trumpet and God's plan, master plan for the world will be completed. But before this seventh angel comes, before final judgment, the gospel must be preached. And so a voice from heaven speaks again. You see here again in verse 8, Go and take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. And in verse 9, he's told to eat it. Now this seems a little strange. Well-known Christian speaker and author John Dixon has vowed to eat a page of his Bible if someone finds a full professor of ancient history who believes that Jesus never existed. Now, so far, John hasn't actually found anyone to, to eat, and he hasn't had to eat any of his Bible, he hasn't found anyone yet. But this voice from heaven, though, is speaking in a slightly different way. He commends John, the author of Revelation, to eat this scroll. Remember that the scroll represents God's master plan for the world, God's plan of judgment and redemption inaugurated by Christ's death and resurrection. So what does it mean, then, for John to be told to eat this scroll. Now, if John Dixon ate a page from his Bible, it probably would taste a little like paper. Uh, it wouldn't be particularly enjoyable. In fact, I actually tried that one time. Actually, yeah, in fact, Aiden's the very first solid Aiden ever ate was actually uh, a piece of paper. <laughs> so anyway, um, I don't think it tasted particularly good. And it might not be the best for you if, if, you, uh, if you eat paper. I'm not sure the doctors among us can tell you what happens if you eat paper. It's probably not great for you. But, but this scroll, though, is very different See there in verse 9, he will take it and he will turn his stomach sour, but in his mouth it will be as sweet as honey. Now I really like Chinese sweet and sour dishes. I'm not sure if they're fundamentally Chinese anyway, but anyway, I, I like enjoy sweet and sour dishes. But John isn't opening a Chinese restaurant here and he's not offering sweet and sour scroll as a menu item. So what does this mean? Well, a similar scroll-eating event occurs in Ezekiel chapter 3. The prophet Ezekiel is also told to eat a scroll, and when he ate it, it tasted sweet. Sweet because of the message was so good to hear, so wonderful. It was good news, news of relationship with God and of life and of hope. Yet Ezekiel was bitter because of the rebellion and the stubbornness of his people. Though the scroll contained good news, people of Israel didn't want the message and it saddened him and it left him feeling bitter. And I think a similar thing is happening here. The scroll represents the gospel message, the good news of salvation. And when John is eating the message, he becomes one with the message, internalizes the message, he merges himself with the message. And it's so sweet because it contains God's words, life-giving words, words of meaning, of purpose, of hope forgiveness freedom 
just as the old John Newton hymn says, how sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes all sorrows, heals all wounds, and drives away all fear. However, these exact same words which bring peace and comfort to the believer are rejected by many in the world. The same words, the same message is sweet to John as the herald, but they are bitter to his stomach because he must speak this message to all sorts of different people who will reject it. Many peoples, nations, languages and kings and even pagan Roman emperors. It puts a sour taste in the belly, sharing divisive news that people will reject and not like. It's like a race official attempting to tell a runner who'd won a, a close and exciting race that actually you didn't win because you were disqualified. Now I saw this once at the Commonwealth Games where an official went up to a celebrating English runner draped in his English flag to tell him the bad news of his disqualification. Now I'm not sure how I could have done that. My stomach would feel pretty bitter knowing that I was coming to this celebrating guy jumping around, bouncing around with new, bearing some bad news, news that he would be, the news that would be disputed and not received well. Well, sharing news of disqualification is one thing, but what about sharing news that will guarantee opposition, even persecution? Sharing news knowing that you'll be whipped, stoned or burned alive. I can understand the sour taste in the belly. There would also be bitterness to know that you're sharing a message that would be rejected. You'd know the consequences of rejection, yet your dear countrymen, friends and family members would still reject the message. And so a voice from heaven recommissions John to speak about judgment, which is both sweet and sour. Then in chapter 11, we see what this recommissioning means as John is told to measure the temple and the altar. Now, I don't think he's actually referring to the physical temple of Jerusalem here because the physical temple in Jerusalem would likely have been destroyed by the time that John was writing his book. It's symbolic. It's a code representing the people of God, God's true worshippers. He's told to count the true worshippers but exclude the outer court. And I think he's referring to the division between believers and non-believers. The temple, those on the inside are the believers and those on the outer court are the non-believers, represented by Gentiles. The believers live among the non-believers of the church. Dwelling within the world represents the vulnerability of the church, the world in which they live. The people of God besieged while the, the non-believing world rules. So you see there in verse 2 that the rule of the non-believers is they trample the holy city. It lasts for 42 months. Now what's the significance of 42 months? Is it the meaning of life, the universe and everything, 42, is that the reason? Well, no it's not. But how long, how long exactly is 42 months? Mathematicians, how long is 42 months? Anyone, how, how, many, how, how many years? How many? Three and a half, exactly right. It's three and a half years. And so it's a highly significant number in, the, in the, particularly the book of Revelation. 42 months or three and a half years is the length of time of tribulation as prophesied by Daniel in Daniel 7, 25 and 12, 7. Time, times and half a time. One plus two plus half, which works out to be three and a half years. But three and a half, again, for those who are good at maths, is exactly half of seven. The perfect number, the number of completion, of totality, of whole, wholeness. And so the significance is that this time of trampling will happen in less than the perfect time. 3.5, it's a number, it's a code, symbol, meaning that something is not complete. It's stopped. Like how a broken tombstone, in a, uh, a broken column in a tombstone symbolizes a life cut short. A memorial to the death of someone who died young or in the prime before reaching old age. So this means that while there is a trampling, it will be temporary. It won't last forever, three and a half years. The non-believers, the persecutors are not going to rule forever. They are not the ones in control. 
This is saying that there will be a time, symbolically represented by 42 months, where life will be tough for true believers. There will be opposition. And in this time period, two witnesses will appear. And so we see there in verse 3, who are these two witnesses? These two witnesses come wearing sackcloth, symbolically preaching a bitter message of repentance and doom. These witnesses will prophesy for the duration of this opposition of God's people. They prophesy for 1,260 days, which is also three and a half years. But who are they? Well, they sound a lot like Elijah and Moses. They have power to shut up the sky and not make it rain like Elijah. They turn the waters into blood and bring plagues like Moses. They could also be Zerubbabel and Joshua from Zechariah 3 and 4, who stand as witnesses in the temple of God in the world with two olive trees and, and golden lampstands. Or they could also be Jesus and the church, for Jesus is mentioned as the faithful witness in Revelation 1.5 and the two golden lampstands represent the churches um, in, from Revelation 2 and 3. So which one is it? Well, I'm not entirely sure. I'm not sure exactly. But these witnesses stand symbolically to represent the witness of God's people to the world. Believers who stand and testify that when the world opposes God's plan, throughout the time, times and half a time, the three and a half years, this incomplete time, God is never left without a witness. And then in verse 7, when they finish their time of prophecy, the beast attacks and kills them. And notice that the story and life of these witnesses follows the pattern of Christ. They're killed in that great city, figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. Now, for those who know their geography, we know that Sodom is nowhere near Egypt. But this represents the worst of opposition to God. Sodom, known for its particular perversion and persecution of God's people, and Egypt, representing oppression and enslavement of God's people. And so this is the worst of the world's opposition to the Christian message. And these witnesses are killed just like their Lord in the same city. Just as what was happening at the time of Domitian, as is recorded in one ancient source describing what happened to Christians in the first century. It says, Plates of hot iron were laid on them. They were strangled, eaten by wild animals, hung and tossed on the horns of bulls. After they were dead, their bodies were piled in heaps and left to rot without burial. And the world thinks they won. The Romans gloated. They cheered. A couple of years back it was reported that ISIS fighters crucified Christians in Iraq who were captured, crucified, who were captured and then crucified. One ISIS fighter said to one man, we will crucify you like your dog, Jesus Christ. He was then stabbed, tortured and nailed to a wooden plank and hanged on a cross before he was shot before his terrified family. The fighters gloated. God is not without his witnesses in a world opposed to him. But note that there is good news for the believers. At the end of these three and a half days, the words of Ezekiel and Zechariah will come true. Zechariah 4, 6, Not by might or power, but by my spirit, says the Lord God Almighty. And as prophesied in Ezekiel 37 in the Valley of Dry Bones, those who have been persecuted and killed will be raised up, resurrected. They will stand to a testimony of the truth and power of God. This will be a fearful sight for those who have persecuted, criticized and afflicted the enemies of God. To see the ones that they've slain be raised up again to join God in heaven. As verse 12 said, Yet there is great fear and terror for those who have realized that they've made a massive mistake. And so this is a picture of the final judgment. There is the ending of all endings to a superhero movie. Earthquakes, destruction and 7,000 people being killed. The survivors give glory to God, but this is not a willing glorification. It's a reluctant glorification. That I must give glory to God for they realize he is worthy of glory. It's time for the final judgment of the world. The photographer goes snap. The action replay concludes as the seventh angel prepares to blow. And we'll find out what happens when he does blow it next week.
but we have to come back to find out then. Or you can just read ahead in Revelation and find out. But here we have a reflection on this confusing and potentially tricky passage from Revelation 10 and 11. But what on earth does this mean for us today? In this cosmic battle of good and evil and judgment and destruction, it seems a little foreign, perhaps if I'm working away at my job or when I'm studying or sitting in my retirement village. It's just so intense and extreme. Well, it's saying that despite our present situation, despite opposition or hardship, there is good news. The gospel itself is good news. Remember the experience of John eating the scroll of the gospel, the sweet and sour gospel. The gospel itself, the message of forgiveness of sins and hope of life with God in heaven is a sweet and good message. So let us never forget the goodness of the gospel, how sweet indeed the name of Jesus sounds. But as we remember and recall and enjoy and ruminate over the sweetness of the gospel, we ought not to forget its bitterness. A crucial part of the good news of the gospel is there is judgment. It's a bitter message for a world that doesn't want to be judged, for those who don't want to accept Jesus Christ as Lord. But judgment is ultimately good because it means that there will be justice for all in the end. Imagine a world without judgment. It would be chaotic and violent. A world of the survival of the fittest, the strongest, the most cunning. But this passage of the Bible reminds us that there will indeed be a final judgment. A judgment which brings relief and hope to believers suffering or being persecuted. Hope that they will one day be vindicated. Hope that those ISIS murderers will be judged. Hope the slayers of Roman Christians will be judged. Hope that those who oppose the Christian message here in Australia today will be judged. Hope that there will be justice in the end. And living with this in mind will mark us out as distinctive because we can handle unjust suffering because we know that there will be justice in the end. We can calm down and rest even if we do suffer from injustice now. And this is in contrast to our modern secular world. To this world, there is no justice in the end, which means I must strive frantically to get it as much justice now as I can because this is all there is. I'm not supposed to be getting justice now and we should strive for justice. So I'm not opposed at all to getting justice now or striving for it now. Absolutely not. But I know that to get perfect justice in this world today is going to be impossible. There'll always be unsolved crimes, mistakes or lack of evidence. But we live knowing that the seventh trumpet is coming, the herald of a new age of judgment, justice and peace. And this also means that we know that we live in a time of the three and a half years where people will oppose and hate and persecute Christians. As Andrew Bolt says, we may be entering an age where Christians are getting more persecuted in Australia. But this shouldn't be a surprise, should it? As Revelation says, this will happen right up to the final judgment. And so we shouldn't be mourning the loss of Christendom and loss of Christian influence in the world. I've seen some Christians who appear devastated by the loss of Christian influence in the world. You know, the removal of SRI in schools, moves to remove prayers in Parliament, the loss of Christian values in our laws, the loss of the connection between this world and the rule of Christ. But Revelation is saying that this is to be expected. The inhabitants of the world will gloat over the suffering and destruction of faithful Christian witnesses. But the seventh angel is coming. The seventh angel who heralds the ultimate reign of Christ. When the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of the Lord. This can motivate and encourage us, us to deal with persecution and opposition today and look for the great climax of history when Jesus will reign. When there will be justice when there will be peace, where Jesus will reign because the seventh angel is coming. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus, that he brings good news of life, hope, forgiveness, freedom and peace. We thank you for this sweet, sweet message 
But we also know that this message is a sour and bitter one because our world stands opposed to you. Give us strength to navigate and live in this world, knowing that our present difficulties and challenges are passing away, and we know that the final judgment is coming. Amen. Revelation 5.13 says, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, may we go from here empowered by your Spirit to live for and worship the one who sits on the throne and the Lamb, the one who is, who was and is to come. May we always give you honour, praise, glory and power in all we do for ever and ever. Amen. Well, that brings us to the end of our, our gathering this morning. I think there's going to be some morning tea. I think the youth are going to be coming to bring some... Anyway, we might have to stick around for a cup of tea. I think there's some... There's some uh, maybe, like the seventh angel, the morning tea is coming. That's right. So we just have to wait for that. Um, next week, our mini-series in the book of Revelation concludes. We look at the last part of chapter 11 as we'll finish our little time in uh, Revelation. Then we'll be moving on to some Christmas-themed things. I didn't think... Going through judgment and angels and stuff would be particularly appropriate to be reflecting on in December as we approach Christmas. And also we have our next all-age worship, our next messy church with all the families together. We all um, sit together. We're actually on Sunday the 10th of December as well, so the second week in December where we'll be having our next all-age worship, which is a lot of fun. So anyway, I hope you have a great week. Look forward to seeing you back here again next Sunday as we conclude the first half of the book of Revelation. Have a great week and see you next week. Thank you.